podcast, uh, yet another for a uh, Monday beginning of the week, ho hum, a um, a dampish, coolish, wettish day here. What are you? What are you, a weatherman now? John, you know, at times like this, you got to be diverse. You got to be able to go out there and find find that gig, whatever it takes. Let me write that down. Is there anything easier than being a weatherman? Really? Well, you have to learn. I get. I think you have to learn to, uh, you know, think in reverse, right? You know, when the, you got the big screen behind you, and that's over there, and left is right, and right is left. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the only thing you have to worry about. Remember Percy Salzman? I love Percy Salzman. I used to. I work with Percy. Where? At Global. At Global. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Percy Salzman, where I grew up, we saw Percy Salzman once a year. What? And it was, yeah, no, we, we, I lived in, in British Columbia. We, we yeah, had yeah. our own weatherman. But the only day we got Percy Salzman was New Year's Day. And for some silly reason. Really? Yeah, for some silly reason. The well, CBC, was Percy not on the national news, though? No, no. He was just on Toronto Local? He was a local Toronto guy. It, 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 Except on New Year's Day, oh. we got Percy Saltzman. And he, by the time he finished with that chalkboard, it looked like every day was a blizzard. So it, it was fantastic. I love Percy Saltzman. But you remember the unique thing about Percy and the blackboard? Tell me. He wrote backwards. No, no, because that, no, that was Dave Duvall who had the glass. That was Dave Duvall who had the glass in front of him. That was at, at CFTO. Was that, was that what it was? That was Duvall. He wrote, Dave Duvall, the weatherman at CFTO, when yeah, right I moved backwards. to Toronto, he, write, he wrote backwards because there was a piece of glass. He would have been perfect for COVID. He would have been perfect. He, he, well, because he got a, the glass in front of him anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, but Percy Salzman was the magician with the big piece of chalk. And he had every every oh, yeah. weather front coming in from left oh, yeah. and right, was, and north and south. It was it was a gigantic mess. Yeah, it probably took ten yeah. minutes to just wipe the chalkboard off at the end of the. And then and the then show. at the end he'd th throw the chalk in the air and say, That's "End." Right. And it was a big ass piece of chalk too. It was about it was, you know, yeah, like know. Old, it was like a cucumber. It wasn't your pedestrian grade three, oh, chalk, no. uh, piece of piece of chalk. Oh no. Anyway, how do we get on this? You worked with lots of uh, legends up there at Global, didn't you? Few. Peter Truman. Truman. Dan Tennant. Uh, you work with Ray Corelli? No. You didn't? Eh? Oh, okay. Never mind. What do you mean, never mind? Well, no, because I thought you'd tell me a great Ray Corelli story. He was the, he was the uh, uh, ink-stained wretch that moved over from newspapers and had the gruff voice and, and uh, became the anchorman at 6 o'clock, I think, after Truman. Oh no, I was I was Pete was still there when I when I was gone. Oh. Okay. Truman and I you want global stories? Well, so we only Tr have we only have 20 minutes, okay? Whatever. We have as long as we want. Oh, okay. Ian Leggett's going to join us later, the golf pro at uh now at St. George's. I think he's actually Oh, maybe he hasn't started yet. We'll ask him. He's going to join us. In that's closer minutes. to my house. Maybe I could play St. George's now. Oh, I have already um, <laughs> put my dibs in. You like St. George's? You I've played? only played. I've only played it once. So. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a great golf course. I, I mean, there's no denying it. I, I just, it doesn't fit my eye. I don't know why. But well, I, because I, the fairways are narrow, and you're supposed to put it on the short stuff. No, I don't know what it is. I, I really don't know. It's, and, it's not a long course. No, it's not long. It's it, it's quite hilly. Yeah. Or there are some hilly parts to it. And you know, um, in my early days, I um, I was well, I was the golf pro or assistant pro actually at uh, Uplands, which is a very hilly course. So you'd think it would be, you know, wouldn't be a problem. But I've just never played well at St. George's. I don't know. Why. Well, no, that's why. No, that's why you, you don't think it's a good course. Well, I didn't you say it wasn't a good course. I said it, John. Don't put words in my mouth. Are, are you going to okay? Are you going to get up and course. Are you going to get up and leave, Mr. Trump? Or what, what is this? I might. It might. No, no. It might. It might. You're, are you ready for the tough the questions? Top, are you the ready top. for the tough questions? If you shut up, I'll answer one of them. It's in the top five golf courses in this country. Some would argue it's the best golf course in the country. Uh, I don't now, know I wouldn't that. be in that. I wouldn't be that guy. 
But top five, okay, sure. No, what I said, John, is, is it's a great golf course, but it's one that I don't play well on. And it's not because it's too difficult. It's just, I don't know what. Yeah, you don't feel uh, maybe, comfortable. Maybe if you I don't play feel more. comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe that, that's right. Now that Lego is there, I'll that's go a, and play regularly, and um, I hope. That's a big move for him. Oh, it's a great move for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway. You watch baseball Saturday? I watch baseball every day. The Saturday game uh, was, ridiculous. was oh, it was ridiculous. It was fantastic. That's well, what I love. I mean, and you know what? It, it's it's funny because in, in the end, it's when people make mistakes that you get the most excitement. And I was and I was actually thinking about this. Would you prefer the one hitter that's one nothing with great pitching, or do you want to see that circus act on Saturday? Night? I, I want to see both. I mean, um, you know, give me. Look, in honesty, give me three days in a row of eight seven. Yeah. And then give me one nothing. Okay. And then give me three more days of eight seven and then give me one nothing. And I'll be happy. Yeah. I'll be happy. I, have, I, I, have... I like I like the pitching duel. I like the psychology of But you fine. don't get those very often because Dave no, Roberts you... is gonna change your pitcher after five. No, you don't. No, you don't. And Kershaw was good yesterday, but he was not at his best. Yeah. But he pitched well. And I want – okay, so let's get to that very quickly here because Kershaw has received a lot of crap for his performances in postseason. And, and it's and fair – Justifiable. Of course it is. It's fair by comparison to his regular seasons. This guy is a guaranteed Hall of Famer. He's won three, three Cy Youngs. You don't get to do that unless you are great. But his performance in postseason has been, by comparison, awful, but even by any standard, no better than mediocre. However, he is now 4-1 and one this year in the postseason. Yeah. And his ERA is, I don't know, two-something. Mm -hmm. um, does that get rid of the stigma that was attached to him well they have to win the series first i think that that really to me is they have to win uh whether it's game six or game seven uh to win the world series before we start thinking about it because it, it, in the end what dodger fans are talking about is 1988 because they haven't won since 1988 right uh and and, and so i mean he can go nine and one well, not realistic, but he he can he can win as many games as he wants. But if the, if the team doesn't win the World Series, uh, then he's still going to have that stigma because he's in many ways he's the face of this franchise. Yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe. Oh, Although yeah. I think I think when you evaluate individual players, you look at individual statistics, not team statistics. Look, if Kershaw, if Kershaw's, I, I mean, this is hypothetical, but if Kershaw over his twenty odd or whatever it is decisions that he has had in world series games had an era of 1.5 yeah. but had a record of 14 and 11 you know how do you evaluate him then then but it's no what no because because that's but that's the va that's the drastic difference between regular season and playoffs um and 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 let's face what it what does that too. mean well because in the end you can have a you know you can have a mediocre a 14 and 11 season for a guy like Kershaw and you can still get to the postseason, and then you can change your whole, the whole dynamic or vice versa. You can have well, a but is particular it, season no. and then have a mediocre dynamic, a mediocre postseason, And it's, it's going to be up to what he does and how many championships he wins. But you're missing the point. I'm saying if he pitched great, but his team didn't hit, and he had but the that same hasn't record been he the has case. now, but his ERA was 1-5 instead yeah. of 4-5 in but, the postseason. I think you look at him differently. Perhaps, but let's face it, that hasn't been the case. Up until – uh, that hasn't yeah, been John, the case. I know that. I mean, it, I, I have another question for you. Cause, I didn't cause know you asked one yet. Well, no, the, the Kershaw one, I actually had, I had that in my back pocket, saved that, but you took it. Um. Is uh, can you tell me on Saturday night 
Kenley Jensen started his career as a catcher. Can you tell me what he was doing on that play uh, oh. with, with, with the winning well, how run? Can I, how I mean, can he, I tell you? I watched no man's land. Did. I know, but I'm just sitting there and I, I'm, I mean, everybody's, you know, everybody's talked to Jensen's back. He's doing this. He's doing that. He's pitching better. It didn't matter. You know what? It's an interesting point for you, but it's not for anybody else. And here's why. Because if, 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 if Jansen is backing up home plate instead of standing, I don't even know where he was, halfway up the third baseline, the ball yeah. the ball is thrown to the catcher. The catcher goes to grab it and swings across, thinking the, the, the runner is going to be right there. And the ball goes sideways. Yeah, but if, if Jansen is Jansen's there to, not going to get to it and be able to get the guy out. So church. what's the point? Well, I, th but I think that he, he had a better chance of getting it if he was – uh, backing up the catcher than he was on the third baseline. Well, as a golden retriever, yes, it would have been better. He would have, you know, but it, could he have done it in time to change I can't believe the you're defending no. Kenley Jansen. No. I can't believe it. He'd have to have been in the wrong place, an, a different wrong place, in order for that to happen. And he, he would have been have to, have to be closer to the, to the, uh, the first base dugout because that's where the ball went. No. Oh. I, I mean, Do you I, have any I, other dumb questions while we're at it? How's no, your day going? Not. Okay. You watched the football last night? Um, who was last night? Seattle and uh, Arizona. No, I watched very little of that game. I, I couldn't uh -huh. possibly care less. Really? It was, it, it's funny. Yeah. Uh, there, there was a point where it actually started after baseball and was going to end before baseball. And then Arizona came back and ended up winning in overtime. It was a hell of a football game. Good for them. I'm happy for them. It really was. And you and, and your I mean, 52 television sets, so yeah. three of which are, are perched in the behind. Well, there. yeah, and one of them always has the president stuff on it. So that's the news TV now. What is that? that. Is, uh, um, CNN? Well, CNN, or I, I actually have the new, the ABC, CBS, and NBC news apps. They're very good during the day. Did you, um, did you watch, did you watch uh, 60 Minutes last night? I did. Trump is a maroon, and we've known that forever, but he just keeps parading out the same crap every time he goes on television. The, the, uh, listen, uh, you know where my politics are. All I, all I will say is that for his base, for the people that were going to vote for him anyway, they would love last night. That's all. They would love, love last night. They would love the baseball game last night? No, they would love what Donald Trump did to Miss Miss Stahl. What a maroon! Yeah, yeah, no. I it, it, listen. It, uh, he did an. Uh, if if I'm if I'm the guys uh, in the Black Tower at CBS, I am actually saying to him, "Thank you very much. You did a great job of of promoting <laughs> 60 Minutes for us for three days." I'm sure their ratings were spectacular last night. I did notice the amount of ads in the show last night were high profile and very expensive. So. Uh, speaking of football, um, it's, it's impossible to talk about the NFL, at least in my opinion, and not, not mention Tom Brady. I, I must say this. I'm not a New England fan. I'm certainly not a Tampa Bay fan. But I cannot, if Tom Brady, whatever team he's playing for. Well, he only played for two. So I know. But... Um, if New England was on, and, and usually they were on somewhere, I, I couldn't not watch. Yeah. And now that he's in Tampa, I can't not watch. So yesterday I clicked around. I saw a few other games that I didn't care anything about. And then I saw um, – What? The New what about the Browns? Game. They weren't on. They weren't? It's not on my TV. I, I don't have the NFL package. I could, I, I'm not paying that money for it. To watch the Cleveland Browns. Boy, what a game they had. Anyway, 16. but you're right about Brady, though. Brady's must see TV. It's is it isn't it? It's extraordinary to me, and I don't. I, I'm I, I'm I've never asked this question. I don't think. It, is it just me, or are there others out there who are mesmerized by this guy? And I don't exactly know why. I mean, his greatness comes from his intellect, his experience. It's not about his. The physical stuff he does, although, boy, he threw a couple of touchdown passes or maybe three yesterday that were just perfect. He, he, plays, this, he plays the game very simple, Bob, you know, and nothing, 
nothing seems to rattle him on the field. You know, you can see him emotionally on the sidelines once in a while, even now in Tampa. But he's just so simple and efficient when he when he when he gets the ball. And it, it really, it truly is, it truly is an amazing, an amazing story, particularly now that his team and he, and let's face it, he's got he, he he's now playing for a coach or with a coach. I think because he probably plays with the coach, not for them, that is so offensively minded in Bruce Arians, who loves to throw the ball, who loves to take chances, as opposed to what Bill Belichick used to do in New England. And then when you see how good Tampa is right now and how everybody thought, well, you know what, they went and signed Cam Newton, this, this giant of a man who has unbelievable physical talent, and Bill Belichick's going to turn Cam Newton around. Well, Bill, Belichick, Newton, put, Bill Belichick put his ass on the bench yesterday, and he, he's and, and Newton is not going to start for New England next week, and may never start a game for New England. You, you don't think he'll start next week? Oh, Belichick already said he won't. I, I, In his post game I, I, last night, had... Belichick said, "What's his name? The other guy is going to, yeah, yeah. yeah, is going to start." No, I, I, I still think that in, in Belichick's mind, perhaps Newton is the starter. But I'll tell you what, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the whole concept. And I, you wonder if Robert Kraft is sitting there saying, you know, maybe we should have given Tom those three years. Why didn't we give Tom those three years? Bill, you are the boss and I trust you. Why didn't you give Tom the three years? Made no but sense to I, me. Yeah, I no, I, I agree with you. But I mean, well, and, and the juxtaposition of Brady being so good in a league where there are five or six really good young quarterbacks is to me just. I mean, it it, it, it the NFL is just sitting there and saying, okay, we've you know, Tom has carried us as a as a, a ratings grabber for two decades. Now we're gonna have more we're going to have you know baker mayfield your guy in cleveland joe burrow yesterday that was a that was a a, a goal Shootout. that was a gunslinging event that was fun to watch i didn't think i'd ever think a cincinnati cleveland game would ever be entertaining in my lifetime and it was fun to watch last night i talked about murray versus wilson both of those guys you know five foot ten great quarterbacks both can run both are smart uh, th- th- uh, there are a, a ton of great young quarterbacks in this league. Ryan Tannehill. I mean, that game, the, that game yesterday between Tennessee and Pittsburgh, where Pittsburgh was up 27-7, and, and you know what? They almost lost it because Tannehill and, and uh, what, the, uh, what the Titans can do is, is fantastic. This, the NFL, without fans, to me, has been as entertaining this year as it's been in, in, in 10 years. Well, that's a topic for another time. Um, we had a couple other things we wanted to talk about, but we actually have a guest. What? Yes. And um, no thanks to you, of course. Um, <laughs> None. Don't worry, Bob. <laughs> I, I mentioned it off the top, and I guess everybody by now knows, so it's not like a big secret. But let's, let's do this. Let's take a, a brief break, and then we'll come back. And um, our guest will join us. This is the podcast. Back in a bit. You, you take my breath away. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, can this be true? can take it's the bob mccown podcast uh starring bob mccown and uh occasionally featuring uh, john shannon occasionally <laughs> well sometimes you're just on and sometimes you're featured 
Oh. That's really my point. And, who, and how do we decide that? I decide. Really? It's not, this is, there's no diplomacy here. This is not a, uh, a democratic society. This is um, an oligarchy. Thank you, Mr. Trump. You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, at the bottom of the screen, um, from Summit, where he is about to leave, I'm surprised I haven't booted your ass out yet. Uh, Ian Leggett, it, as of next week, will be the head golf professional at St. George's. No, no, the general manager. Get get it right. Okay. He'll be the general manager at St. George's, or yeah. or more appropriately, the managing general, <laughs> who will tell the golf pro exactly what to do every minute of the day, hovering over him like a, I don't know what. Never mind that. Bob and I, we need uh, next Tuesday, we need like uh, we need a tea time. Yeah, 10.30. And we need a tea time. We'll just see how this goes, and then I'll decide, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, gosh. Um, uh, first of all, I mean, I, you and I have talked a few times uh, since the announcement, but uh, from, for public record, congratulations. You must be very excited about this new job. This is, I said to Shani earlier, I don't know where you rank any golf course. And you and I have had this conversation before, too. Yeah. I, but St. George is top five in the country? No, oh, easily. Yeah, probably top two or three. Yeah, no, it'd be in the top two or three. I mean, when you have that argument, it's an argument. Anytime you of get a discussion, it it's a it's the great debate of, you know, ranking of golf courses and where they sit. I mean, but, you know, in the U.S., you've probably got five or six that are always going to be in the debatable number one spot. In Canada, you've got, you know, three or four. You've got Shaughnessy, you've got the National, you've got St. George's, in my opinion, Toronto Golf. So I think he put those in in the top four or five, and you know this is a debate. Wow. So come on, you got you to put some of the new, on that gotta, list, huh? You got to put some of the new ones on. You got to put some of the new ones on. Come on, not necessarily. You got to talk. You know, you got to talk about our friends out in, in Cape Breton. I Absolutely. Come yeah. on. No, no. Cabot, I think Cabot I think Links, Cabot, Cabot Cabot Links, Links is a good. I'm I'm not a big big fan of the cliffs. I think from a a beauty standpoint, it, nothing. There's nothing more beautiful than that golf course. But a playability. You know, the Lynx is a much better golf course. So, excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll make it five. I'll include my list. I'll make it five. There you go. Yeah, okay, good. But I tell you what, you're absolutely right about, in my opinion, Lynx versus Cliffs. Because yeah. I, it, it, but different designers, right? That's the magic is different personalities, different designers, different topography. Yeah. And uh, I mean, too, you're not missing much if you, you know, getting out there and seeing that place is special, as you know. So, by the way, already booked. Of course you are. July 9th, 10th, and 11th of 2021. <laughs> keep already your fingers booked. crossed, Shani. Keep your fingers crossed. Oh, yeah, well, keep your I'm, mask on, too. No, I'm, gonna, I'm going out to quarantine this time. I'm going to go out and quarantine and camp. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm telling them I'm coming to camp on the 18th tee, and then, uh, and then I can play. Uh, Lego, I've been trying to get Shannon to wear a, uh, a COVID mask while he does this show. Uh, not necessarily because I'm worried about being infected from afar, but um, I just, I can't stand looking at him. <laughs> so, He's uh, not he, that bad. Hey, Ian, nothing has changed in 15 years. Absolutely not. Nothing has changed. I haven't seen I haven't seen either one of you guys. As we, as we know, we haven't seen each other in quite some time. I'm actually impressed that, you know, Shani, I thought you'd be, you know, have less hair, and I thought, you know, Bobcat would be much grayer than he is. So, congratulations on making it through this far. Uh, hang on, Ian. Something in my eye here. <laughs> so you got to do that now. You see, I couldn't do that before on television. <laughs> um, so this is weird. Um, as as all get out, uh, we are what two weeks away from the Masters. Yes. Um. Can you, can uh, this? Uh, and by the way, it's not March. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, uh, you know that's Feels my like point. It. it is the it it is the first rite of spring. It is it is especially for us here in the northern climb. You know, you know, ninety nine out of a hundred years, our golf courses aren't going to be open when the Masters are on uh, when Augusta's on. Well, some of them will be open, but a lot of them won't be open yet, or just open. It's just the very beginning of the golf season, but up here for sure, yeah. But but it's it's kind of the indication. Ah, we have survived another winter, and golf is ahead. Exactly. And now it's like um, we have survived another summer, and golf is about to end. Mm. 
well, an unusual summer too, as we know, that wow. nobody wants this uh, golf to end. It's been the escape that we've only had, uh, other than watching a few games on TV. It is the only escape, and it turned into an epic year in the game of golf, uh, fortunately for all of us, uh, and to those people that took the game up, because yeah. um, it, it's been epic to the amount of people that have taken up the game, come back to the game. Yeah, um, what else to do? Yeah, repurposed their summers. Kids that couldn't go to camp and play soccer, they took up the game. Families joining golf clubs, uh, you know, public golf courses you couldn't get tee times on. I, I, and now, you know, the ter the future, um, you know, holds of do we continue to capture all these people in the years to come? So um, I, I, th I think it's been, if there's an upside to such a, you know, devastating time globally, uh, golf has had an upside because of, because of a pandemic. The interesting thing is that in it, it, it happened at a time when golf was actually changing its rules to make it more playable and to play faster. You know, yes. Like and simple things like leaving the pins in anyway. Uh, but then I think, I think the actual, you know, the business of golf ad adapted better than most and said, okay, here are four, four or five simple little things. We're going to make it easier to play the game and we can put more people through it. You know, like even, even you know, like how you get your ball out of the cup, the fact that, you know what, we're not going to, we're not going to be as serious about the bunkers, uh, through the summer as as we normally were because we don't want you handling the rakes it, it to me it was how all golf courses adapted to the demand and it made it it actually made it for me it made it more fun to play the game this year i i think the safety protocols you know created that safe the the speed that we saw it wasn't the other way around i i you know when they put the you know leaving the pin in is if they would have made that a mandatory you know, rule change, then we would have seen substantial, you know, pace of play changes. As we know, you know, our, our good friend, George Pepper, uh, you know, editor at Golf Magazine for many, many years, uh, you know, said it's about a, you know, 13 to 15, 15, 13 to 15 minute savings of time when you leave the flag in. So the bunker thing has not been an issue at Summit Golf Club or any private club from what I understand. Guys enjoy the, hey, you hit it in a footprint, you get to fix your lie and tip it up. And, you know, there's a pace of play benefit there. The guy who walks into the bunker and forgets to take the rake with him has to go out, you know, walk 30 yards uh, to grab a rake. Those type of things have been positive to the game of golf. Um, the worry I had in the very, very beginning, which, uh, you know, was was greater than that was the socialization of the game and i realized that sooner or later when you go out and play with your three buddies and you can't sit down and have a drink afterwards and share a sandwich and talk about your round mm -hmm. there was a time there where people played the game they went straight to their car and they went home and when the socialization of the game pet came back which for all of us and you know other than the pga tour players lpj tour players um, the socialization is not, uh, you know, a component of the game. This is what they do for a living. But guys like us, the socialization is a key component to playing the game. And fortunately, when outside dining came back and we were permitted to use the clubhouse, um, you know, I think there was another uptick in the game that brought back some normalcy to why we play the game of golf. With Ian Leggett, um, soon to be the... Uh, general manager at St. George's, not the golf pro. Those days are over. Can't play. <laughs> um, where was I going to go with this? So, um, was it your experience that when outdoor dining came back, that more people stuck around? than in previous years. I'm not talking about in the er, uh, in early in the season where you had to mm -hmm. you know, arrive ha you know, no more than a half hour before yes. and then you had to leave right away. Like, mm -hmm. come in, play, get lost. Yeah. When that eased, was there more action on, like on the patios? Oh, 100%. Like, than previous and, years? Yeah, for sure. And, and really? what we noticed is 
the safety protocols that were built around just the members being here. And in the beginning, we had to keep it to members only. It had to be only if you had a tea time. Right. We gave a time period of 90 minutes maximum that you were permitted to sit there. And we were able to turn those tables over quickly enough. And not everybody spends 90 minutes. As you know, they'll have one sure. beer and they go home. Um, so, but what ended up happening was the family members, when we opened it up to family members, the safety protocols that were put in place here made it safe for them to come here. They were not interested in going to, you know, their favorite restaurant patio and not knowing who is on property, not knowing who, you know, is serving them, not knowing what the safety guidelines are. And for Summit, and I know this was, was the case at a lot of golf clubs, especially private clubs, is the member was got very, very comfortable with it. And that's the one thing that we hate to say. I hate being comfortable with this. I hate being comfortable with putting on my mask and you know, having to sanitize my hands before you sit down. All those type of things that we put in place that everybody did to keep everybody safe, both members and staff. And then guys started bringing their wives here and their husbands and you know things like that. And the kids started showing up when we allowed that happening. So it became more of a, you know, a restaurant, an opportunity for them to step outside of their house and come and dine because we created such a safety and safe environment for them. Let me ask, let me ask you this. I, and, and then John, I'll throw it to you. I promise. I, do you know of any positive COVID test as a result of somebody going to a golf course? In other words, do you know of anybody that caught COVID at a golf club? Um, yeah, there, 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 there have been it? some, some traced, uh, very, very minor though. And, and fortunately the amount of efforts, especially for me specifically, and the network of all the GMs, uh, in the GTA before we opened, we really came together on creating a safe environment and putting what would happen if, you know, mm -hmm. Mr. Smith showed up and tested positive and he played golf for three days and, you know, sat at right. the patio. And so there were a couple incidents, but they, they were able to nip it in the bud very, very quickly because through tracing. I mean, it's a lot easier to trace somebody who's comes to the golf course, you know, exactly where they've been, who they, uh, where they've sat and, uh, who they played golf with. So, um, I, I did not see any, you know, it was just one-offs very, very minor. And it was taken care of very quickly. You know, one of the uh, the downsides of it, Ian, though, was that uh, uh, some of those great charity tournaments that you used mm -hmm. to have uh, disappeared. And, and I, I don't mind saying one of the, the highlights of my summers was always the one that you ran at Summit uh, for, a yeah, very great event. for a very personal issue, Stomp the Stigma. Uh, how, how do you how do you regain the momentum there, and when and and how do you try to give back to your charities now that uh, that you didn't have the opportunity to uh, to have an event as powerful as it was? Yeah, I, I you know fortunately you know from a small degree, I, I had some teams that still paid their entry fee for this year. Wow, it cost sixty five hundred dollars to to bring a team to our event, uh, as you know, Shani and. Um, we had some companies that still wrote that check. So that, that was one thing. Um, fortunately for us, Stompless, we do not have an infrastructure that we need to support like a sick kids or, you know, some charities that have, um, employees and, you know, they, they've got expenses against it. We are actually, uh, through the Kyle Brandon Travis foundation, we support those people we write checks to them to keep them afloat. So yeah. we're not in that space where, you know, we were, you know, up against the wall on how are we going to, you know, even keep the door open. We were supporting those charities that did that. So, um, and Bank of Montreal has been incredibly supportive through this as well. Um, uh, Daryl White and, and Bank of Montreal have continued to support uh, Stomp the Stigma and the Kyle Brandon Travis Foundation. So we're able to continue to uh, fund those organizations that need help around suicide prevention. What? Hey, I mean, I don't know if you've even talked about this, but is this a summit event or is this a, a Lego event that you could take to um, St. George's? No, this will continue to stay at Summit for one more year. The board here has agreed to continue after I'm gone. And, 
you know, as, as you both know, this is something that's very, very close to my uh, heart. That means a lot to me on a, more than just a supportive. It's a, it's a personal thing for me. So, um, you know, that will continue at Summit Golf Club with Ian Leggett and you guys and all my celebrity buddies and uh, supporting there. it. And uh, the members here have really gravitated around this event. It really, you know, outside of what we do in many communities across this country with the money that we raise and the support that we give them, this really has come, become a community driven summit golf club event. Uh, I would say a third, a quarter to a third of the people that play in it are summit members. Um, so uh, the club takes a lot of pride in this. Hey, uh, it, on, a, on a little lighter topic, how would you, uh, how would you define what the PGA has done this season as we prepare for the masters? Where, was it a, was it a good year? Was it, was it one where, uh, again, because they were outside, it uh, was a little bit of a re of a relief from the pandemic. I think they did great. Uh, I had Andy Padzer on uh, on my show early on in the year, and all the protocols. I mean, it was thirty four pages of protocols that they put together, and you know, obviously they've had some positive tests. Uh, it's never good when number one in the world, Dustin Johnson, can't play in a tournament. Adam Scott can't. Um, guys are having to withdraw from terms, but when you, when you think about the, uh, I guess the minor impact of it, um, it, I, I think it's been very positive. I think they've done a great job through testing protocols, uh, keeping everybody safe. Uh, for me personally, I don't watch golf for spectators. Um, I don't really notice them when I'm watching golf. Like you do, you know, you hear them during a, a baseball or a hockey game. Um, obviously you do hear them when something happens, which is definitely going to have an impact, uh, uh, that we're going to, we talk about at Augusta and how, you know, the patrons can impact the result of a golf tournament. Um, and interesting, I got in that conversation the other day, um, does Colin Morikawa win the PGA championship with 50,000 people on property? Good question, isn't it? You know, so, um, uh, there's no doubt about it. I've been there. I've done it. Um, your, you know, your nervousness gets elevated, your, you know, your focus can be jaded when all of a sudden you're leading a major championship or you've got an opportunity to win a golf tournament and you've got, you know, 10,000 people following you around. So, no, so, but, but let me ask you this, you, you talked about the noise. So if you're sitting, uh, you're sitting on Amen Corner and you hear a roar from 16, it has an impact? Absolutely. It sure does. it does. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And you can't it hear it, can't you, Lego? Yeah, and, and guys will be checking to see what is happening too. And it, it you know, like they say, the, the, you know, the Masters tournament is one on the back nine. And that is not specific to just um, execution of the player's ability to get it done. It is also strongly influenced by what you hear around that golf course. There's 70,000 people cram themselves into that back nine as the field moves around the front nine. So, um, and there's no doubt about it. I mean, you, you've heard guys tell stories about it before. I standing on Tiger Woods talked about it, standing on 16 T and having to actually catch his breath for a moment there when he's got an opportunity to win that golf tournament. We witnessed what happened to Jordan Spieth and he's never recovered from what happened to him on the 12th hole uh, when he chunked it in the water. We right. seen Tiger Woods when he won, what happened to player after player hit it in the water there. So um, there's an influence of the gallery there. There's no doubt about it. Uh, we got to go, Lego. Um, but um, you know, I'm going to put you on the spot right here uh, on the program and um, ask you if you'll come back uh, during the uh, during Masters week. I'd love uh, to and chat with us about because uh, we, we we sort of plan on talking a little bit about it. And we got yeah. off on other topics, so we'll come back. Absolutely, love to, fellas. Thanks, uh, pal. Ten thirty Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's. I think there is another St. George's somewhere around. I'll find you a spot though. <laughs> you're all hard big boy you're all hard uh, all right love you guys yeah get get john shannon a time for 10 30 you and i will play at uh, 10 20 oh. uh well, that's it for the you podcast. don't even like the course you don't even like the course i love the golf course oh, I don't, I don't oh play here it we well. go check the top I check just, the top of the podcast 
Yeah, check Andy, it, Lego, Andy, because like, that's yeah. what I said. You, you know, know I you love know St. George's. He has a tough time with that really short green stuff in the middle. <laughs> well, he usually kicks it out there, so what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, there might be something in my eye again. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, Ian Leggett, John Shannon, Bob McCowan. See ya. See ya, gents.